Great. All right. Well, good evening to everyone. Um, so I'm going to start off with, um, well, I'm doing two talks, as Kevin said, but I'm going to start off with, first of all, looking at FIDO2. And I'll look at how FIDO2 applies to Azure AD, but I'll also be looking at how FIDO2 works as a protocol and how we can eliminate passwords with FIDO2. So let's get started. If you've got any questions, by all means, pop them in the chat window as, we go, as I'm going along. Um, I won't sort of necessarily instantaneously see them, but Kevin's going to keep an eye and I will periodically review any questions that come up. For those of you who don't know me, I, I work as an identity and security architect and I consult sort of all over the world. I also run a couple of uh, very deep dive masterclasses, uh, one on identity, uh, particularly around the Azure AD space and federation, and the other one is on troubleshooting uh, protocols. That's protocols for uh, authentication and also authorization. So what am I going to cover? Um, I'm going to look at, first of all, at why passwords are a problem. I'm going to do that fairly quickly as we all know that they're problematic, but I just want to have that checklist so that when we start looking at FIDO2, we can see how we can basically put a line through all of the problems in that checklist. So I will start with going passwordless and just talk about how we get to that sort of space. And then we'll get in under the hood to see exactly how FIDO2 works. And then finally, we'll have a look at FIDO2 with Windows 10 and Azure AD and signing into Windows 10 with uh, FIDO2, but equally well um, authenticating against Azure AD as well. So that's the agenda. Um, the runtime of this will be around about 50 minutes. And as I say, uh, by all means, just pop questions into the chat window. So first of all, why are passwords such a problem is they are a big, big problem because they rely on a shared secret. Number one, we have to generate a shared secret and users are terrible at creating secrets. They always produce are predictable things. We're then going to pass that shared secret to a relying party. And that relying party could be a security token service, uh, which is doing authentication for a whole number of different apps, regardless of where they're located. So that would be a, some, some form of federated identity server of some kind. Or it could just be a straightforward website, which has its own, maybe a forms uh, credential database. But we rely on that password being stored securely. Now, as I say, users are extremely bad at coming up with good, strong passwords. I mean, I wonder how many COVID-19 passwords are out there today. Probably an absolutely huge number. So we choose stupid passwords, which then makes the account extremely susceptible to spray attacks. And a spray attack is where we take a sort of predictable password and we spray it across multiple accounts. We're looking for low hanging fruit. We're just looking, hopefully we don't care who the user is. We just get in using some user account. We may have a more targeted attack, which is against a single user, in which case we're doing a brute force attack of some kind, rolling passwords against that user. The other big problem is on a very, very regular basis, identity stores get hacked. And when those identity stores are hacked, uh, it's quite likely that we've got the username and the user's password being stored. And if you, if you don't know the website, have a look at Have I Been Pwned? And they report, you know, 438 pwned websites. That was probably about two months ago when I originally put that slide together. And actually, an enormous number of pwned accounts. As soon as those accounts are available on the dark web, then what's going to happen is we're going to start attempting to do credential stuffing. It's also referred to as breach attack. And what we're using is information that has been found, published on the dark web, and we're using that to try and attack. And again, we're trying to look and pick low-hanging fruit. And then, of course, there's the email that goes out. And, you know, you see this message, multiple emails are pending delivery. Please update your delivery preferences here. That 
message looks extremely genuine. And then, of course, you click here and you end up at a website which looks probably like your corporate logon uh, to Microsoft. And of course, being a good citizen, you check that you've got a lock in your window, so it's using HTTPS. Uh, you check the certificate's valid and you have a quick look at the URL. And you probably think that's a genuine Microsoft online URL. That URL, um, oh, a few months back, I could have bought for 99 pence. And I could have put up a, a, a website and I could have tried to persuade you to come and give me your credentials. Because as soon as you log in there, you've just given away everything. And attacks are, are really quite sophisticated in terms of trying to get the same look and feel as someone's corporate site by screen scraping their actual logo banner. Password resets are another big problem. Um, the resets could be done by already compromised email alias, or they could be done via knowledge-based authentication security questions. But quite often people give away um, the answers to those questions, maybe on a social via social media disclosure of some kind. Challenges. Educating users about passwords is extremely difficult. MFA is an absolute must. It's going to eliminate 99.9% .9 of sign-ins with compromised passwords succeeding. In most cases, a very simple SMS will do. It will suffice. It will stop that low-hanging fruit being picked. Um, however, if you've got a targeted attack and someone is trying to actually target, um, SMS is not a good solution. So if you've got high value accounts or you've got con you want convenience, then uh, uh, you certainly want to go away from SMS. And one of the things people go for is authenticator apps. The problem with authenticator apps is that uh, people get very sort of blase about saying, oh yeah, I approve. Um, now, what you need to do is again, educate your users to actually say, you never approve anything unless you can see the login dialogue and you have triggered the request. But then you get things like, you know, uh, Outlook, which has been misconfigured. And before you know it, you know, it's approving you to approve your second factor and you are simply clicking approve. So one of the things to do is don't over prompt for MFA. So don't go and use a, um, a policy, for instance, which makes people prompted on a very regular basis for MFA uh, because people will just get complacent and just go approve. So how can we eliminate passwords, uh, eliminate them being compromised? Well, the thing to do is to get rid of shared secrets. And that's the key. We need to eliminate shared secrets out of the system. And Azure AD did a very nice password list sign in. Um, you can, uh, when you go to sign in, you put a, your username in. As soon as you put your username in, you are then being asked to approve. And you're being asked to approve and you need the Authenticator app to go with it. And so you go to your Authenticator app and rather than just clicking approve on the Authenticator app, you have to show that you have seen the dialogue requesting you to do the approval. And here, what we've got on the dialogue is a number. And then we got three numbers on the Authenticator app and we actually have to select the appropriate number. And that way it ties you up so you don't get into that situation where you're sitting on the beach and suddenly you, out of habit, you get prompted to approve and you just hit approve. The only way you can approve this is if you select the correct number. Now, this is a great solution and works extremely well. The thing is though, if we want to get rid of passwords on the whole of the internet, what we need is something that is completely internet scalable. And for that to happen, we need standards. Now, FIDO, which was the Fast Identity Online Alliance, it was founded back in 2012. And its mission was to actually create passwordless authentication protocol. And that's what they started out with. 
In December 2014, they were doing pretty well. They published two protocols. The Universal Authentication Framework, which is referred to as FIDO UAF, and that was a passwordless, passwordless protocol. And they also published a second factor authentication protocol, which is FIDO U2F. FIDO UAF didn't gain a huge amount of popularity, but FIDO U2F did. And there are quite a number of organizations, including Google, that use U2F as the second factor. Um, and I'll come back and talk about that again shortly. 2019 was very, very significant. They, the FIDO Alliance was working on the FIDO2 core protocols. And one component of that is WebAuthN. And WebAuthN was actually adopted by the World Wide Web Consortium as an internet standard. As soon as that happened, everyone went, hey, we can really move forward. And so immediately, lots and lots of vendors released FIDO2 keys because they had a standard to work against. Microsoft also changed the Microsoft Hello and got it certified as being FIDO2 compliant. So Hello is FIDO2 compliant. And then, of course, you, so you can do FIDO2 with Microsoft Hello, but equally well, you can do FIDO2 with lots and lots of different FIDO2 keys. Um, and they come in many, many different form factors. So, what happens is we replace shared secrets with asymmetric cryptography. So we have a user with a browser and we have a relying party. Now, as I say, the relying party could be a website which manages its own authentication, or it could be a security token service, um, you know, as an identity provider managing authentication for many organizations. So our user wants to go to that relying party and they want to authenticate. Well, before they can do that authentication, they will need to register themselves with the relying party. And what will happen is within a secure store on the user's device, uh, they will generate a public private key pair which will be associated with that particular relying party. So we see there the relying party ID is example.com. That's our, our site. And we have a private key, which never leaves the secure store, and a public key. I say, we have to go through a registration process, and we'll see exactly how that works shortly. But the relying party itself will store user IDs and public keys. And that public key will be associated with the registered user. The user can now send a signed message to the relying party. And that signed message uh, arrives at the relying party. And the relying party can validate the signed message uh, using the public key. The private key never leaves the user's secure store. So it never leaves the user's possession. Um, and what we're doing is sort of simply validating the signed message. Now, when we do that, what we can do is say a couple of things. Number one, if we can validate the signature, then we absolutely 100% know that the message has not been tampered with. And then we can also say that the user who has sent us the message is the owner of the private key. That's the private key associated with the registered public key. Now, that private key never leaves the owner's possession. See, the only person that knows about that private key is the owner of the private key. And the private key is held in a secure store. So actually, if the owner is John, John never sees the private key. What he'll need to do is he'll need to allow the secure store to be accessed. So he'll have to validate against it. Now, if you're wondering about uh, signed messages, um, I've been asked this question many a time, so I actually added this slide. So when we, we want to send a signed message, and we want to be able to check the veracity of that signed message. So there are two players in this. There's the signer, and there is the verifier. So what's going to happen is the signer is going to take the message, 
and they're going to put that message ready to transmit and they're also going to pass it through a hashing function and what a hashing function does is it produces a fixed length digest that hashing function produces a fixed length unique digest for a particular message. So it doesn't matter what the length of the message is, the actual digest will always be the same length. And mathematically, the chances of a collision, i.e. two digests being the same for two different messages is for all practical purposes, zero. So we take that hash and then what we do is we encrypt it with the private key and we add it to the signed message. So now sitting in the signed message is the signature, which is a encryption of the digest. That message is received by the verifier. So what the verifier does is they take the signed message, they pass it through the identical hashing function and out the end comes a digest. The digest held by the verifier at this point and the digest held by the signer should be identical. But how can we check that it is correct? Well, the way we do it is we decode or decrypt the signature and we do that with our public key that we've got. That's the public key associated with the private key. And then we've now got the original hash back the hash digest that was created by the signer. And now what we do is we just verify that they're equal. And if they are, we absolutely know two things. Number one, the message has not been tampered with and the sender has the private key, which is associated with the public key. So that gets us uh, sorted out on the, uh, the signing and the verification. So now going into a little bit more detail, um, what happens is when we want to authenticate, um, we start off the authentication sequence in whatever way. Um, and the first thing that will happen is the relying party will send back a challenge. We then take that challenge. Um, we can't do this in the browser. We have to pass it through an API uh, to some backend method of taking the challenge. And what we're going to do is we're going to sign a response, which is the sign challenge, and we're going to sign it with the private key associated with that particular relying party. So we're going to pass the challenge into an authenticator of some kind. And that authenticator could be a platform authenticator or it could be a, 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 you know, a FIDO2 key. Um, the user will need to prove their identity to the authenticator, so they will need to verify themselves, and they could do it by a biometric, if the uh, authenticator supports a biometric, and if it's Windows Hello, they could do it via uh, facial recognition, or they could do it via a PIN. Um, and having authenticated, um, the message can then be signed, the response can be signed using the private key associated with that particular relying party, and we can send back the response. That response, by the way, is referred to as an assertion, which is not to be mixed up with an attestation, uh, which I will come to um, later. Um, at assertions and attestations, I find people mix up all the time. Um, here, we're asserting our identi identity. So we're responding with saying, this is the particular user. The attestation, as I say, I will come to shortly. So um, what happens is the relying party gets a response. It says, okay, it's come from a particular user. What I need to do now is verify the signature which they do with the associated public key. And the job's done. Now, if I want to set up a FIDO2 key in Windows 10, what I do is I go to security key, and I, if it's a brand new key, never been used before, I will need to put a pin on it. And then having added a pin, um, if it supports it, I can add a biometric. So many of these keys support the ability uh, to have a, a fingerprint 
uh, reader on them. Um, if you've already got a key with lots of credentials on it, um, what you can do is you can reset it. Um, but if you reset it in Windows 10, you get an error message which looks a little bit like uh, the one on the right-hand side, could not complete a security reset. Um, why they couldn't put a little suggestion on that message saying, make sure that you attempt the reset within 10 seconds of powering up your key, I don't know, but they haven't put it on. I, I have put it in as a request that it's added, but at the moment it isn't. So if you see that message, pull the key out, push the key back in, and then perform the reset. If you to use FIDO2 keys in Azure to actually sign in, what you would go to is the authentication method policy, which currently has FIDO2 security keys in it and the Microsoft Authenticator passwordless sign-in. In the future, expect to handle MFA through here, self-service password reset, and password. You could probably, in the near future, turn off passwords being used in Azure AD completely. Um, but if we're talking about FIDO2 keys, so we say, yes, please, I'd like them. So we enable the use of FIDO2. Uh, I could do it for all users, or I can select the targeted set of users. Uh, Self-service setup is not available at the moment. There's a switch for it, but it doesn't, doesn't work at the moment. Uh, and force attestation, uh, which is on, on the button on the lower right-hand side down here, I will come back to the meaning of that shortly. So that gets our FIDE2 security keys working in Azure. Uh, we still need to register the key, and I will talk about that again shortly. But let's get in under the hood. Let's see how this actually works in much more detail. So first of all, looking at the components and the protocol. So the, the core component which was uh, adopted is the WebAuthN. And what WebAuthN does is it does registration because we need to go through a registration process with the relying party needs to know what the public key is. So we have to go through a registration process and then it supports authentication. So the relying party, as I say, it could be just a website. It could be a website which is backed by a number of FIDO to, or uh, you know multiple websites backed by a single FIDO2 service, um, or it could be a relying party such as Azure AD, which is a security token service or an identity provider. Sitting uh, on the client side, there will be a browser and there'll be some client-side JavaScript running in the browser. Uh, the browser is not gonna be able to do any of the clever stuff. So what it needs to do is talk to some web auth n APIs. And all modern browsers now support the web auth n APIs. And they in turn will talk out to a roaming authenticator, or they could talk to a platform authenticator. And talking out there, they use a protocol which is either CTAP1 or CTAP2. Uh, CTAP is Client to Authenticator Protocol. Uh, CTAP2 is the full-blown FIDO, uh, FIDO2. Uh, CTAP1, you remember I said U2F was adopted for two-factor authentication. Um, so rather than making U2F keys redundant, um, WebAuthN will support just doing second factor authentication if that's what you want. So we can just do second factor authentication. And if we do that, we can use U2F keys. So CTAP1 will support U2F. If we're using FIDO2 keys, we can go passwordless and we will talk to the roaming authenticator using CTAP2. Now, how do we actually talk to the roaming authenticator? Well, we could plug it in. It could be a USB device, uh, or we could be using Bluetooth low energy, or we could be using near field communication. So we've got various options there. Um, we've then got the ability to have uh, the platform authenticator, and the platform authenticator is talking to a, a TPM of some kind. But you could also implement um, a key or, or, or authenticator could be implemented in software if you wanted to. 
Um, but here, we're, if, if we're talking Windows Hello, we're talking to the TPM to support that. Okay. So the authenticator can generate a public-private key pair. Uh, it will store the private key pair. It will never leave the platform or never leave the authenticator. It's a roaming authenticator. And what we'll do is we'll pass across to the relying party the associated public key as part of the registration. And so what the relying party will cry, it's its own APIs. It will need to talk to a user and the public key store. So it needs those public keys stored somehow. And then what it will also want to do is talk to an attestation trust store. That attestation trust store might be sort of loaded into the relying party, or we can actually talk out to an external metadata service. And what an attestation is, it is proof of the veracity of a particular authenticator. And if you want a particular authenticator type used, you can specify that. And what you'll get is when, as part of the registration process, and uh, you will get coming through to the relying party, the actual um, attestation data, and then the relying party can verify that it's happy with the authenticator that is being used. Now, if you're building a website, you probably don't care which authenticators are being used. But if you're a bank, you may say you can only use a particular authenticator. And that's where attestation metadata comes in to sort this out for you. So those are our main components of the protocol. Um, Two ceremonies I've alluded it to, you have a registration ceremony and you also have an authentication ceremony. So let's start off and look at the uh, registration ceremony. And the first thing that happens with the registration ceremony, uh, you'll have some sort of interaction with the relying party and then the relying party will say to you, create a credential. And this is a fairly complex command which has lots of options. And these options give us the real power. Number one, we have a challenge. And a challenge is just a random string of bytes, and it's used to prevent replay attacks. And what we'll do is we will sign the challenge. Exactly how, we'll see in a moment. We will also send a relying party ID. So if my website is xtshub.com, I will send that as the relying party ID. We'll see how that's used as well. We'll then send a randomly generated ID that is to be associated with the credential uh, for the user. Uh, we'll then specify the types of crypto keys that we're happy to use um, and uh, yeah, uh, that are acceptable to the relying party. Now we can specify things about the authenticator. We can tell the type of authenticator. We could say, you know what, uh, I don't want you to use a platform authenticator. I don't want you to use something like Windows Hello. I always want you to use a uh, cross-platform or roaming authenticator uh, because, you know, I am the XYZ bank and I'm going to specify the type of authenticator key that you should use. So I can say cross-platform straight away. So you can specify that in this create credential. Um, we can also say if the authenticator private key should be residential. Now, yeah, you think this is strange. I, I said to you, the private key never leaves the user's possession. Well, that is true. Um, but what we can do is rather than keeping it in the authenticator, we can, under certain circumstances, pass it back to the relying party. So we pass the private key back to the relying party, which seems complete nonsense. But before we pass it back, we encrypt it with a key that is only known to the authenticator. So really, we're giving back a piece of crypto to the relying party, which can be sent back to the authenticator, and the authenticator can unwrap the key and get back the original private key. Um, that should only be used if you're doing two-factor authentication. 
So what you can do is you can authenticate to the uh, relying party. And once you've done the first factor, the relying party can give you back your wrapped key because right, you don't really want to give back. It's, it's not really a risk, but you don't really want to give your wrapped key back to anyone. But now you're giving it back to the genuine um, site. And what the authenticator will do is using its burnt in private key can actually unwrap it and get back the original private key. Um, the last option under the authenticator selection is uh, to say whether um, the user verification, the authentication is required, preferred, or discouraged, right? Um, now, if you're doing password lists, it's absolutely uh, preferred. And this is the user authenticating themselves or verifying themselves to the authenticator. Um, and they'll either do that with a biometric or a PIN. But if it was two-factor authentication, your first factor is your username and your password. And the second factor is proving that you're in possession of a key. And what you could do is you could just touch it to prove you're there, all right? And what you're doing there is proving user presence. Uh, there's a timeout parameter you can send, and the timeout parameter is just saying, hey, give up after a certain period, all right? So if we haven't got the correct information is, I'm gonna time you out. Um, and then we can specify is if attestation data is required. And we, this is the relying party saying, yes, I need to know what the actual uh, authenticator is. I no want to know the details of that. So as I say, quite complicated. So the first thing that comes in is we get the create credential. And the first thing is we take the relying party ID and we check it and validate it against the origin that the browser's seeing. So I, the example I gave was xtshub.com as the relying party ID. And we validate that that is what is being seen by the browser. If someone's got in the middle and we're being spoofed, we might be going to xtshubs with an s.com. Well, at this point, what we'll do is say, hang on a minute. The relying party is saying, is saying it's xtshub.com, but the browser is connected to xtshubs.com, at which point we immediately reject. So we've immediately got rid of the man in the middle attack where we're being spoofed or, or spammed to go to a rogue site. So immediately we've really gained. The next thing that happens is we pass through the relying party ID, the user ID, the various options which say whether attestation is required, et cetera. Um, and we pass that through to the authenticator. And now, um, remember this protocol will actually handle two-factor authentication or password list with FIDO2. If it's password list with FIDO2, the user has to verify themselves to the authenticator. If it's two-factor, then all they'll need to do is prove they're present, actually just touching the thing. So, so now the user verifies against the key. We'll, we'll keep on the FIDO2 theme. And the first thing that's going to happen is, remember, this is the registration ceremony. It will generate a public-private key pair. And what it will then do is store against the um, credential ID for the user, it will store the private key. That private key never ever leaves the authenticator. The next thing it will do is it will build and sign the response. Now, there's no point in signing the response with the private key because the relying party knows nothing about the private key. But what it can do is it can build and sign the response with the attestation private key. Um, and it's not on a per uh, device, right? The attestation private key is on a, a particular model of an authenticator that every single device will have the same attestation private key. Um, if each device had an attestation private key, it would be possible to track users through that's the signature we're getting back. So we'd know we could track users across the internet. So for privacy reasons, what we do 
is we just simply have an attestation a private key that is burnt into a particular model of a particular authenticator. So we assemble and send the response back. And what the relying party can do is verify the origin. So checking nothing's in the way. Uh, it can verify that it's got the challenge back correctly. It can verify the attestation signature if it wants to. And because it's an attestation, which is actually there is an attestation trust and a root trust, we can verify it all the way up to the uh, root. So we, we trust it just in the same way as we would verify an X509 certificate to root. We can do this with the attestation um, public key. Um, uh, but actually, some people don't bother checking the signature. They say, OK, I've got, you know, there's no man in the middle. I've got a private key back associated with a particular credential ID and it's come back to me in a secure channel. I'm happy. But if you want to, you want to get that extra step, you can verify the attestation root trust. Um, having done that, what we do is we store the user ID, the credential ID and the user's public key. And that completes that registration ceremony. Now, in terms of the attestation metadata, I've probably covered pretty much everything on this slide because uh, I've mentioned it. Um, there is the ability to call out to a metadata service. And the FIDO Alliance has a, a metadata service. And the metadata service allows a manufacturer to publish information about their particular authenticator. They can even actually publish an icon for their authenticator. So what can happen is the uh, relying party has a problem with it and you've used the wrong key it could actually give you a picture back of what the key should look like. So you can do that, those sort of things. But what metadata does is it allows the, um, the relying party to do risk-based decision uh, about a particular authenticator. Um, you can decide um, which authenticators to use or not uh, by identifying an authenticator using the AA GUID, or it's called the Authenticator Attestation GUID. Um, and as I say, the attestation private key is burnt into the, the, the device, uh, but it is across a, a model, not across an individual device. Now, what we haven't talked about at all is identifying the user. And there's a number of options for identifying the user. Uh, we may not need the user's identity. What we need to know is the same user registers and then comes back to us. Well, we, we can do that. We don't need to know who the user is at all, if, if that satisfies us. What we do know is when that user comes back, we know 100% it's the same user, because what they've done is they've signed a message with their private key, and only that user has the private key. Right. Um, so we could do that, or maybe we send an email, and they have to verify via an email as well. Uh, it's up to you. Um, Trust on first you, you've now got absolute guarantee that the same person's coming back um, and the, the credentials can't have been leaked. Um, you could do an invitation process. You could send an invitation to a user and you could send it via email. Or if you say, actually, do you know what? I want to verify their mail address. I can send the invitation via mail. Um, actually, and then what we can do is we can give them a code and they can come back and when they register for the first time, uh, they generate their private public key pair, but they have to identify themselves using a code. Uh, you could do complete identity proofing if you wanted to. Uh, the user might have to turn up and show themselves, you know, and, and this could work, for instance, in, in an HR department. You could have the user show up or maybe some government office. They, they have to come with documents. They have their presence. Um, but what you're doing is you're binding that user with the additional identity proof to the public private key pad. And then what, another method you can do is binding to an existing credential. And this is what Azure AD does. Um, so when we've got uh, our particular key, what we do is we sign in, right? And we register that key against a strong authentication that we use. So we're signing in with multi-factor and then we register the authenticator and the authenticator is bound to an existing credential. Now, 
the, the thing is you cannot back up these authenticators in any way because they're true to their description. The private key never leaves the authenticator. So it's impossible to back up. But what you do for recovery is to register more than one key against a particular uh, relying party for a particular account. So the authentication ceremony, um, very, very simple. Uh, relying party, credential ID, challenge goes from the relying party. So we immediately check there's no one in the middle. All right, so originally checking the origin that the browser's seeing against the relying party ID. If that's all right, we pass all of this lot through to the um, authenticator. The user, and we're talking FIDO2, proves their verification against the authenticator. Uh, we retrieve the private key uh, using the credential ID, uh, and then, or we can actually, rather than doing it against the credential ID, we can retrieve it for the relying party. So we can go nameless as well. So no names are involved. So passwordless and nameless. And we're going to send back the credential just for a particular relying party. Um, the user, well, we verified the user against the authenticator. So it is the correct user. And then we build the response, signed this time with the private key. And once again, we can go through and validate everything, and we verify the signature using the user's public key. So we know 100% that it is actually the response has been generated by the user who is in a, a possession of the associated private key. And at that point, we're authenticated. Uh, what I want to do is give you a very, very quick demo of this. Um, and I'm going to, I've got a number of websites and, and I've got these websites in the, the slides. So you'll see them come up shortly. Uh, but I'm going to use this site, WebAuthN.io. And this is actually a site sponsored by Duo. Um, and what I'm going to do, it is purely a test site. I'm going to uh, register a user. Um, register a user called John. And um, what it's asking for, first of all, it's saying, hey, I'd like to do this with hello. Remember, Windows Hello is FIDO2 compliant. So I can register it into FIDO2. Um, it's not letting me use the camera because uh, uh, Zoom is using the camera. So uh, I'm going to have to put a pin to unlock hello. I don't want to register the key against hello. And, and I'd recommend you don't. Um, the reason being is there's no nice, clean way of clearing up the credentials at the moment. It can be done, um, but you actually have to delete the Windows Hello container. And then when Windows Hello rebuilds itself, it can sometimes be a bit problematic and you have to troubleshoot it. There, there will be a solution in the not too distant future. So I'm going to click cancel here. And the next thing is it's saying, touch your security key. What it should really say is, touch your security key and prove it's you. All right, I left it for too long, it's timed out. So we got a timeout request. So I'm gonna close that and I'm gonna go back in again and register. And this time I'm going to touch the, I'm gonna cancel that and I'm going to touch the security key when prompted and it's using a biometric read, and it successfully registered me. If I go to login, I can select, it's called chase the mouse, I don't know why that's happening. Uh, I go to login here, and um, it's saying touch the security key. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna touch it with the wrong finger, so it's not gonna read the biometric, and it's just seen it as false. It's seen it as false again, it's seen it as false again, and now it's prompting me for the pin. Remember when you set up your security key, you had to put a pin in first. Um, so I put in there, and now it's saying, touch your security key, and this is to prove that I'm actually here. So I'm not gonna use biometric, I'm not gonna use a different finger, I'm gonna touch the key, just prove I'm there, and I'm signed in. And what it's got, it's showing me the raw ID it has stored, and it's showing me the public key it has stored as well. So it's a nice, it's a nice website for just testing things out. Um, let's do, let's try again, and let's register a second user. 
and I'm going to register in here John 2. Um, this time I'm going to change some things. Attestation type. Yes, I want an attestation which will prove um, the type of key that's in use. And then the authenticate type. I'm going to say, hey, let's not use cross-platform. Uh, sorry, let's use cross-platform. Let's not use a platform TPM. So cross-platform. I'm going to go to the advanced settings, and I'm going to say use uh, a residential key. And, and that is required if you're doing for implementing FIDO2 properly. So uh, we'll register. And the first thing that pops up is a message. A record of your visit to the site will be kept on your security key. Reason being, I said make a residential key. So I'm going to continue that. Next has popped up is touch your security key. Now, there was nothing about hello anymore because it said use a cross-platform authenticator. So I'm going to touch my security key and get a biometric read on that, which should work, which it has. And then the last message box that pops up, it says, what web auth IO wants to see the make a model of your security key. And that is because I said, send the assertion data across. So we allow it and that completes the registration process. Um, so as I say, the, there's a number of different websites where you can go and test these things out. Um, and there that's in the uh, slide deck um, later on at the end. Okay, um, white and black listing authenticators, you can do in Azure. And what we can do is we can uh, um, actually set it in and we can enforce key restrictions. So normally it's no, but we say yes. So we're going to allow specific keys or we can block specific keys. So it's a white list to allow things or it's a black list to block specific keys. Um, and that is done by the AA GUID or the Authenticator Attestation GUID. And this one here, which you may not be able to see, I'll see if I can zoom this, yeah. Um, the Enforce Attestation there is actually going to verify that the attestation data is using a proper registered key rather than a self-signed certificate. Uh, so you can use self-signed certs um, in keys. Um, in terms of block security keys, uh, you'll get a message like this. If you get blocked during registration, we detect this particular key type has been blocked by your organization. Contact your administrator. Quite nice, easy. Thing is, if you change that AAD GUID and block the key after it's been registered, you will get a message like this. Um, your company policy requires you to use a different method to sign in. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't explain more than that. But that, that's the reason that particular key type is now blocked using the attestation AA GUID. Now, when it comes to Windows 10 sign in with a FIDO2 security key, yeah, you can set that up. Um, however, recommendation if you're going one to one is to use Windows Hello for business. If you want to go one to many, is to use a FIDO2 security key. So now I can use passwordless authentication against many different devices. Um, and what you'll see is once you've set it up, uh, you'll see that the, your login changes to Windows. It says insert your security key into the USB port to sign in, and then touch your security key, which we know is actually touching it and identifying yourself to it. If it's not a biometric key, you will be prompted for the PIN for that particular key. Now, how about SSO to on-premises? So if we've got, um, uh, you know, we register a device into a zero AD, we use a username and password normally to register our device. Uh, we probably may need, well need to use second factor as well. Um, but then what we do is we get back a primary refresh token. And that primary refresh token will allow us uh, SSO to every single resource which is secured by Azure AD. If we go to something on-prem, then we've still got our username and password. So what we can do is get back a Kerberos TGT, as in a ticket granting ticket. And using the Kerberos TGT, we can go back and get a session ticket to any on-prem 
resource. That works beautifully. If we, however, use a FIDO2 key to sign in, we're using FIDO2 credentials. Uh, there is no username, there is no password. Uh, we get back a primary refresh token. So we've now got SSO to everything in the Azure space. But if we try and go against on-prem, we fail. We cannot get a TGT back. So Microsoft have a solution for this. And you need the latest version of Windows 10. Um, you need the latest build of Azure AD Connect. Um, and then having done that, uh, what will happen is using PowerShell, uh, you can actually create a dummy RODC in your on-prem AD. And when you create a dummy RODC, it creates an RODC KRB TGT account. And it also creates uh, the, the dummy RODC computer account. And associated with that will be the TG, KRB TGT key for the RODC controller. And that is uh, double encrypted and sent up to uh, Azure. It's encrypted with an encryption key. It's also encrypted with uh, SSL. And then it's encrypted with the Evo STS key and held up in Azure. Um, to make all this work, we need a patch for 2016, 2019 domain controllers, which has now been rolled out. And uh, when it comes to signing in with FIDO2, what we do is FIDO2 against Azure AD. Um, it then knows that we are part of a particular on-prem AD. And what it passes back is a PRT, which gives SSO to everything in Azure and a partial TGT, which allows us to go to an on-prem Kerberos uh, server or domain controller and swap it for a full-blown TGT. And that way we have SSO to all of our on-prem resources as well. This is, this is very, very easy to set up. So we can now live in a world without passwords. So in summary, um, a user is required to create a password. No more. It's created for us. We don't have to think about password. It's a cryptographic key pair. Remember, private key never leaving the user's possession, which is locked in a security device that can only be released by their user. User reveals their password for a phishing attack. Well, you could give away your PIN via social engineering, but hopefully nobody would. But of course, a, an attack's not going to succeed without the authenticator itself. Um, all credentials are scoped for a particular relying party. So that completely eliminates the phishing attack sending you to a fake website. So we got rid of that problem as well. Um, the target system holds a database of usernames and passwords and possibly KB questions and answers. If someone attacks and compromises the relying party, they can steal absolutely everything. The usernames are um, just a unique randomly generated identifier. Obviously, the, people might, the, the database might hold other things, but in terms of authentication, um, it's a unique identifier. And the passwords are no longer there. It is purely a public key, and those can be stolen, and they're absolutely no benefit to the hacker at all. Um, if you want to play, I put some sites on that. I used Web Auth NIO. Um, there's some very nice uh, different sites you can try stuff out. Um, if you don't remember the, the links here, uh, if you have a look at a blog, uh, I've got a blog about uh, FIDO2, uh, and I've also got sort of Q&As that I'm adding together. Um, and I see I've got one question. Do, do I recommend any particular uh, keys? Um, I, there are keys coming out all the time. And so it's very difficult um, to uh, uh, recommend a particular key to you. Uh, if you go back to the uh, slide I had earlier, which had sort of various pictures on there, um, there are, there's a good selection of keys on there which, which will work. But as I say, keys are coming out all the time. Uh, if you are choosing them as a security officer, uh, you might want to actually start looking um, at uh, attestation details for the particular keys before making those decisions. Um, and, and that actually um, completes, 
completes this session. Um, I, as I said, said right at the beginning, I, I have an identity masterclass and also authentication protocols, troubleshooting masterclass, which I, I run around the world uh, doing, uh, except I'm not running very far at the moment. So these are suffering from lockdown. Uh, but hopefully, uh, we do have one scheduled in Switzerland in August, but I don't know if that's going to run. Otherwise, hopefully, things will start up again in September, October, November time. Um, I think it's a, a 15, uh, a five minute break. Is it? Is that right, Kevin? Do you want to take over again? Um, oh, yeah. If there's any questions, by all means, ask at the. I'm going to stay around. I'm going to have to go to the fridge to get a beer, but then I'll be around to answer questions. So back to you, Kevin.